Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone here and there. Good morning. We're gonna try to other try to get started on time. And look at everyone who's here. We go to mass is optional, and people come back to church. That's what happens when you mass. <laughs> uh, pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, very good. All right. Well, hello, everyone. And for those of you who are not with us uh, here in Dallas today, we've had, uh, you know, I, I think this is true of a lot of the country. Uh, someone had a meme up the other day said, it seems like Mother Nature just throwing out Powerball numbers for temperatures. 52, 71, 30, 15. <laughs> sort of the way. Hey, Henry, welcome. Come in. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, so today, uh, I think is an exciting day. Uh, we're we're starting a new study. Hello, guys. It's almost Mardi Gras. Well, yeah. Um, in fact, um, our son Garrett. Some of you may have seen on Facebook. I posted a photo. He came through here yesterday on a layover. And he's on his way to play Mardi Gras uh, with a band. So, wow, uh, wow. yeah, at, at one, of, I mean, like everybody's there, you know, it's just crazy. Well, we're, not we're not there. <clears throat> we're not there. First time. Well, I guess we're not everybody. <laughs> he's really thin. Yeah. Be that boy. He he eats. So he's our he's our vegan and. Uh, it eats really clean, so yeah, much much better than his father. Yeah. yeah okay. Wait. Well, the other fun. couple. How are they? Oh, they're so. Long story short, uh, they they closed on their house in Houston on Friday, and the movers that had their stuff in storage here only brought twenty five percent of it and thought it was all of it, and now they can't find the other seventy five percent of it. Oh, no. So. Um, that's a story for later, but uh, hopefully that crisis is going to get resolved today. <laughs> um, sort of between uh, Houston city proper and Cyprus, in, oh, up in that northwest area. Yeah. You know, David's parents are in Houston. Oh, I forgot that. Yeah. Well, it's a long story. I'll tell you afterward. But okay. um, yeah. We have time. Real estate. Jeez. Yeah. Right? Crazy. <laughs> So today, we're going to begin uh, what I think is going to be an eight-week study. <clears throat> I know you don't believe me when I say anything like that, and with good reason. Uh, and really, I think it will be an eight-week study on the book of Ruth. And uh, last week, we let you know there's a text I'm going to be following loosely um, that uh, we have identified. Uh, Charlene sent that information out in an email as well. Uh, you're welcome to read along. Uh, this is this 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 uh, text that's inspiring this study um, was written by two Irishmen, uh, and it was written out of their experience in um, dealing with people of differing opinions out of two big shaping events in their part of the world. One is what is loosely known as the Troubles, and I, everyone's aware that this is the, the the war that went on for decades between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, right? Um, and we can talk more about that as we go. <clears throat> but then the other, is they were writing this book as Brexit was playing out, uh, which happened to be about the same time that I was also on sabbatical in Wales uh, and watching everything play out there, also very fascinating at, at the same time. So these are the two big events that are shaping this, uh, but it has direct parallel to so much of our American discourse, and it is eerily relevant to the current moment with Ukraine and Russia. And so I'm not going to say I was prescient in choosing this study, <laughs> but it is <clears throat> really, really relevant to us today. So uh, of the two authors of the book, 
Uh, one of them died before the book was published. Uh, but the other is a poet whose name I'm going to massacre because it's it's an Irish name, uh, Padrang Ochoama. That's what I'm going to call him <laughs> until someone straightens me out. Uh, and that sounded good. Yeah. Does that sound good? It's yeah. Than I can do. <laughs> so he is affiliated with this group in Ireland uh, called Corimialo. Uh, I believe is the name of it, uh, that is basically a peacemaking uh, initiative. And it's fascinating. Uh, he is, so Mike Caps has met this guy, and that's how he got onto the book, and that's how we got referred to the book and uh, all this, right? <clears throat> so I actually want to begin today because uh, th this poet has written other books besides the one that we're going to be drawing our study from. And one of them is a book mainly of poetry that I also recommend to you if you like poetry. Uh, I've just been enthralled with it this week. And the book is ironically titled, Sorry for Your Troubles. Remember the play on the word, The Troubles. Sorry for Your Troubles. And it's almost like a parallel poetic reader to the text we're going to be studying. So, th this Sorry for Your Troubles book is mainly poetry, <clears throat> but it also includes some sections of prose that introduce some of the poetry. And I seldom do what I'm about to do, but I want to just read you a section of this, the, 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 the prose that introduces some of this poetry, because it's a great introduction to the study we want to begin today on the book of Ruth. This section is called Bury the Hatchet. I heard of a woman who was shunned out of a community in Belfast. She had an hour to pack a life and leave. She had two children. She didn't know where to go, and a white van turned up from Corey Miela, his organization. The driver said, I'll take you somewhere safe. And having no other option, she piled her bags, her children, what of her life she could take and her very own self into the van. Not knowing who or what Cornelia was, she also took a hatchet. <laughs> Cornelia began as a place of peace and a place of deepening division. Ray Davy, its founder, had been an army chaplain during the Second World War and was captured and held in Dresden, where he witnessed the Allied forces bombing of the very same city. He could no longer think of sides. When he returned to Belfast, he began the dream-making behind the Corinela community, an open village, a place of safety where people of diverse identities, politics, religions, and viewpoints could gather for learning, community, and faith. There were some nights in the 1970s when they slept scores of people whose own homes had been made unsafe. What happened to the hatchet? I'm sure she kept it. I met a man who said that when there was trouble on his street, he slept on the upstairs landing in front of his children's bedroom doors. He slept with a hatchet. He slept armed for their safety. The folks of Corimila have long believed that human encounter between people who believe and think different things can have a transformative effect. Transformative because it is more courageous to have an argument with a person in a room than never entering that room in the first place. Transformative because when you can be in a place of beauty, it might be that your mind can be open to new and creative possibilities, and because to lighten the shadow of our land, we must all speak of our own shadows. Transformative because when you have an ethic that challenges scapegoating, you may be able to open up a way of reflecting on your own shortcomings. Transformative because they believe in the power of the shared table and the poured cup of tea. Morning meetings start late in Corimila because they know there are some conversations that can, be only take, that can only take place in the dark by firelight. Many of the poems in this book were written following participation in the encounter groups that I've talked to you about before, where adults met and spoke with each other, run by Corey Mila, or East Belfast Mission. One woman got up once, 
and left the room because a question had been too difficult. When she came back, another woman said, I cry in the bathroom too. It was an acknowledgement, a solidarity, a sharing of the ground. It was also containing a kind of kindness. It helped her hold herself together. People spoke of enjoying being chased by police in the riots. A blind woman spoke of walking up roads with permanent potholes. An art teacher spoke of the prisoner who used to paint the flowers from the still life class every day until they died. Women spoke of being divided by a large green gate, of finding new stories when they practiced the language of fruitful disagreement. People come from other places too many places of conflict. One time, a room full of people were asked when they first became aware of conflict in their society. They told stories of five-year-old wisdom, six-year-old horror, seven-year-old lessons. They told stories of learning to lie so that your daddy's police job wouldn't be known. They told stories of parents lying in order to keep a semblance of order. They told stories about guns under beds, about knowing why you don't go out at night, and stories about playing doctors and nurses for bomb victims. We had artists and poets there responding to the stories. The art does not stop the story or even heal the story, but it can create a marking, bear some witness, honor the truth time of the story told. The Cornelia community believes that the quality of the telling of a story will be related to the quality of the listening of the people. There is no shortcut to human encounter. Susan McEwen told me this. So she makes sandwiches and space and tea and provides tissues for the talking spaces that she holds, and she holds them well. She curates encounters with a careful tone. She's the one who invited poets and artists to listen. And she tells us that we must listen well. Etymology hints at some words in the hidden fabric of the word story. We hear echoes of words that have been used to speak of the wise people and echoes of words that mean see. To tell a story means to see wisely. It is wise to speak of grief. It is wise not to rush hope. It is wise to not end a story before it is ended. It is wise to listen. It is wise to see. A blind woman took part in a long-term story project once and told us of how she saw the troubles. She used the word saw and she laughed at us. <laughs> she had had a landlady who used to follow and watch for her safety when she, independent and confident, walked down roads that were known for hostility. She walked bravely, and she heard and saw what was really going on. Once, in a room, a person talked about having taken a life. These words were carefully chosen. Another spoke about a war. Another spoke about legitimate targets. Others said that some things are regrettable, but that the story was bigger than blame. Others said they live every day with the truth of their doing. Language is so loaded and in the middle of it all, one man used his words to name the names of people he had bereaved. Parent, sister, friend, partner, children. Another time when I was traveling, I met Ali Abu Awad from the Parent Circle, a forum for bereaved Israeli and Palestinian family members. It was Good Friday, and I had hoped to pray but couldn't find the concentration. Ali, chain-smoking, spoke in his third language with dignity. He told stories of humanity and generosity. He told a story of his dead brother and a story about finding friends in unexpected places. After that, I didn't feel the need to pray, as Ali had done it for me. I felt the need to tell him this, to tell him that his telling had sacramentalized this holy hallowed, hollow day. But when I tried to tell him this, looking out over the hills of Beit Shahur, Shahur, I just cried and couldn't stop. He put his hand on my shoulder and whispered, I'm not a very good Muslim. 
And I laughed and said, I'm not a very good Catholic. <laughs> we stood and looked over the beloved hills. One woman said that she wasn't sure if meeting people from the other side was going to be kind. She'd lost three members of her family, she said, and she wondered if the folks she'd be meeting would be embarrassed to meet someone like her, the pitiable victim of a national cause. Another man said that when he was sentenced to inhuman jail time, he wondered what had happened to the humanity of the judge. The Irish word for forgiveness is mathiunus. It comes from the word maith, meaning good. The words the same or similar in Welsh and Gaelic and another local dialect spoken across the islands of Brit Britain and, I and Ireland. To forgive someone is to good them. To forgive someone is to treat them with the goodness with which they did not treat you. Curiously, this syntax arranges power as the possession of the troubled one. It is they who can good. And if the one whose hands caused the trouble asks for forgiveness, they say, Maith Dom, good me. Forgiveness is not a person, place, or thing. Forgiveness, like priesthood, if it is to be anything, must be a verb. Mind you, it isn't the only way to pack up your troubles. Forgiveness can be a burdening thing, too, and there are many good ways to honor bereavement. For some, forgiving is too much like forgetting, no matter what we say. I wouldn't argue with them. So they pour pure energy into justice, story finding, body finding, and survival. Maybe that hatchet doesn't need to be buried. Maybe it can be used to fell a tree, to clear a path, to build a house, to shine, to be proud of. Powerful, huh? Yes. Bury the hatchet. So this is the this is the co-author of the book we're <laughs> digging into now, and um, I, I want to just introduce. Uh, I want to introduce the book of Ruth to us today uh, out of this and some, some background. Um, the, let me just ask this. Before we talked about this, how many of you have ever read through the entire book of Ruth before? Okay, most people, yeah, at, at some point. But it's only four chapters long. It's, 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 it's not a big story, right? Um, and yet... Um, we find in it some timeless themes. Remember last week when we talked about how the Bible came to be and why some of these books were kept and some were, some were not. And one of the reasons, it, it's very much like the stories we tell from our own history. Uh, the ones that, and, and, and why I say Shakespeare, uh, which I'm not saying is divinely inspired, but there, there is a there is a permanent resonance with these themes, and this is what we find in the book of Ruth as as well. Um, Ruth is important when kindness and compassion seem to be in short supply, and dear God, if that's not where we are today, I I don't know, right? It is a simple book. It is a really simple book. But we've got to overcome a stereotype first, because in most of American culture and in European culture, the Book of Ruth is thought of as a wedding text. <clears throat> Sorry to break it to you. And if you use this text in your wedding, God bless you, your wedding's still valid. It's not like a Catholic <laughs> baptism where someone said the wrong word, all right? <laughs> I saw a wedding band that a lady had requested when she got married at Fairly Wide, and it had in Hebrew letters where the thou goest out, I will go. I said, well, it's a great text, but it had nothing to do with marriage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this text, whether thou goest, I will go. It's a lovely sentiment. Yes. It makes a great card. 
you know? I'm sure my daughter-in-law didn't know who it was originally sent to. <laughs> right? So, yes. We had a song at our first wedding. Okay. Well, again, there's nothing wrong with this. By the way, 1 Corinthians 13, which was recited in full at our wedding, has nothing to do with marriage. That was our second right. wedding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're killing me today. <coughs> oh, my God. We're going to shoot for a third, baby. <coughs> yeah, wow. Right. Well, so this whither thou goest theme really is lovely, and we think of it in, in, uh, in marriage terms, and that's fine. It is inspirational. It's, it, there's nothing wrong with that. But we've got to dig beyond that and see the original context for it. And this is a, this is a story uh, about the mystery of relationships between people. Uh, because in this story we're going to encounter, <clears throat> there's the trauma of surviving one's own children. One of the truths of life that is so difficult is no mother or father should ever have to bury their own child. And yet many of you know the pain of this. This is, this is part of this story, right? Uh, there is the pain of childlessness in this story. There's the challenge of marriage, and there's the challenge of severe patriarchy here. Uh, the story also is about crossing borders. And Lord knows this is the story of our life today as we are living in the greatest global migration that has happened in centuries. Uh, if you look at the big global scene, right? <clears throat> this is a story about famine and not having enough food to eat. Uh, this is a story about finding shelter in the home of an enemy as well. So this book, as we study it in the next few weeks, is going to challenge us our, our ideas of welcoming the stranger, on the stereotypes of those who are the other, on finding some gaps, like this story I just read, illustrated, on some gaps where compassion might thrive within our debates and our laws, and how we deal with losses that cannot be grieved. There's a lot in this story. So, I want you to know, first of all, that the book of Ruth is part of the Hebrew Bible, as we talked about last week, uh, and it's also used, interestingly, within Jewish tradition. So, you know how in uh, our part of Christianity, we use something called the lectionary. And uh, so, the lectionary is what our Sunday scripture texts come from. And so, this is a, a lot of Christian traditions have come together and created this set. It's a three-year cycle that covers all the major elements of the, of, of the biblical text. Not all the elements, but all the major elements. So that every week within the lectionary, there's a gospel reading, there's an Old Testament reading, there's a psalm, and there's an epistle. Uh, and they're, they, they are organized in such a way <clears throat> that the relevant uh, Hebrew scriptures match somehow the theme of the gospel reading or the epistle reading. So this is why you'll often see in our Sunday services, we'll have two scripture readings from different places of the Bible, but they sort of relate. And you can say, oh, I see how these go together, right? Well, in Jewish tradition, they have the same thing. Um, and Ruth is part of uh, a section of Hebrew scriptures called the Megaloth, uh, which is also called the Five Small Scrolls. So these are the books of Ruth, Esther, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and Lamentations. They all sort of go together. We, you remember we talked about how in children's Sunday school you learn to group the books of the Bible? Mm -hmm. Well, within the Jewish tradition, this is how they group these five books, right? And they also are tied to the five main annual festivals uh, of Judaism, and they are read in their entirety alongside a specially chosen text from the Torah, the books of Moses, right? And here's what's interesting that most Christians don't understand. The book of Ruth 
is associated with the festival of Shavuot, which we know as the Feast of Pentecost. And it's paired with Exodus 19 and 20, which tells the story of the giving of the Law of Moses on Mount Sinai. And you may say, what in God's name does the book of Ruth have to do with the story of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai? Well, here's one passage from that account, all right? On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning as well as a thick cloud on the mountain and a blast of a trumpet so loud that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They, shook, they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. The smoke went up like the smoke of a kiln while the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses would speak and God would answer him in thunder. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people not to break through to the Lord to look. Otherwise, many of them will perish. And here's this little book of Ruth right alongside this. Why? Well, the author of our study text says, there is a small but extraordinary detail in the middle of this tumultuous story that's worth noting. The account tells us that a lone human voice pierces all the den and is heard and finds a divine voice responding. <clears throat> Ruth, he says, is a relatable narrative that gets beyond the din of all the loud God talk we have. We are so focused on all of the thunder and lightning and finding God in the big and loud things and the declarations that we may miss the small, still voice of God among us. There are also simple human kindnesses that are ultimately transformational in that they result in the securing of a place for a displaced people. These generous acts also result in the transformation of the lives of those who extend the kindness. This is what we find in Ruth. So he says that this festival liturgy, this Jewish connection of the text, connects the struggles of human individuals with the great mountain-shaking events of Sinai. They're like an odd couple in this. And it then preserves this common human experience of a human person in the face of great world-making events and dares us to make personal what would otherwise be overwhelming. And isn't this how we see the world today? We can listen to the news, we can watch the news, we can hear the news. Take Ukraine and Russia, for example. And it seems so unbelievable and so large that we can't figure out what to do. But as some of you saw, I wrote this story this week about being on a Zoom call with European Baptist leaders and hearing this Ukrainian Baptist pastor explain the situation to us on, what was that, Thursday, I guess? And... Um, he gave this final appeal. He said, we want God to be glorified in this. And he talked about individual people and what they were doing. And as he said these final words, the line went dead and he disappeared from the Zoom. Like he just flickered out. He, he was gone at that point. I'm sure he lost power. I'm sure he lost the internet went down, whatever. Because the troops were advancing at this time. And he's, uh, he's in Kiev. And Knowing that one person, hearing that one person, gives us a different perspective on the bigger story than just saying, there's a lot of people fighting over there. Knowing one person makes a difference. And the story of Ruth, I hope we will find, is a way to get to one person that helps us open a greater understanding of God's work in the world and to see something beyond all the loud noises that we keep looking at. That's what we hope to do with this study. Comments? Thoughts? What time is it? I don't know. 10.30. 30, 29. Yeah. Okay, we got a few minutes. Look, let me just pause and, and take your 
responses, thoughts on what we've said so far. I've talked a lot. Mainly not my words, though. Shirley Vaughn says she was surprised about the book uh, that Naomi would have been the great-grandmother of David or Ruth. That's correct. Ruth would have. Yeah, there. this also fall, this falls in the Davidic lineage, which means it falls in the Jesus lineage. Mm. <laughs> and and yeah. I think that tells that it was written after David was king. Right, Has, because otherwise how could they have said that? Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, excellent point, David. Yeah, other thoughts on this? Why was this included in any as opposed to other books not included. So if Jim's asking why is the book of Ruth included, so I, th I think, personally, there's several reasons to include it. One is it's an important part of Jewish heritage, uh, and it's probably included, just as David said, because, because Ruth ends up in that lineage that leads to David, that leads to Jesus, right? Uh, so the, for, the, for the Jewish people, the the lineage to David is what matters. In the Christian tradition, you know, the, the lineage to Jesus is, is what we would emphasize. But I think it's also included because it is a story that resonates with, a, with an oppressed people. And Judaism, certainly throughout time, represents an oppressed people who have been on the margins, cast out, ex exiled, Right? Uh, and, and, and this is why we find such a compelling character in the president of Ukraine right now. Because of his own family story of being of Jewish origin, having family in the Holocaust. Uh, and it's just, it is all wrapped up in one story, right? And there is a timelessness to Ruth that... Um, is it is the personalization or the personification of some of the bigger themes of scripture, I think, and that's why it's there. Yeah, Pat. Mark, while I'm working with this Afghanistan lady, um, it's made me realize how would you feel if you were left your country, your home, and gone someplace where nobody knew you and you could not speak any of the language? And uh, as, as you know, we've run into a problem right, with the right. apartment people have. have Doing something but anyway, it's, it's just like staggering when you think about it because I'm trying to teach her English and I don't speak Persian. <laughs> right, I finish for the phones here, but it just has made me just realize how important it is for those who come to our country to, you know, befriend them. Yeah, thank you for that beautiful testimony. For those at home, uh, the, the word is about helping the, someone from another country who's come here, speaks another language. Uh, a refugee and asylum seeker, and just how difficult it is. If we put ourselves in those shoes, right, we, we hear, we see differently. And this is what Ruth compels us to do. Uh, we, we want to think of Ruth as this sweet love story. And it is that in a way, but it's also the story of courage and finding your way in a new place when desperation forces you to leave. From Christy Walters. I actually read Ruth from the perspective of loneliness and widowhood because it was a good message of finding care and help. Maybe I put my own spin on it. So from Christy Walters, who is a widow, she read Ruth from the perspective of being a widow, and it that's beautifully said. Beautifully said. That's the point of all this. So one of the big themes in Ruth is a, the Hebrew, a Hebrew word we've talked about before uh, called hesed. Uh, this, this word is often translated into English as loving kindness. We talked about this back through several studies lately. It, hesed is about acts of generous and generosity and kindness that someone chooses to do in favor of another, which is what relates back to the opening reading about I good you. This is loving kindness as well, right? And the author here says, while such an act may be towards someone we know or are related to in some way by blood or ethnicity, 
they are most particularly kind acts that are done despite obvious differences, which we are not obligated to perform. In Jewish tradition, hesed is a vital contribution to another Jewish idea called tikkun olam, which is the repairing of the world. The repairing of the world. The law itself can't do this. Torah in Hebrew cannot do this all on its own. Law can compel acts of generosity, but it cannot supply the magnanimity, that's a hard word, magnanimity that draws generous actions from us in places where the law doesn't extend. I, um, if I can get to this here, if I saved it in the right place, uh, I've got an example of this to close with. And where on my iPad did I put this? Yikes. I don't know where it went. This is very bad. Mark, how do you spell Hessen? C-H-E-S-S-E-D is the transliteration. But it's pronounced Hesed. Right? Um, well, I'm just going to have to tell you this because I can't find the... Uh, what in the world did I do with that? Never mind. I thought of this yesterday. Um, I, I've mentioned before, some of the meanest pastors I know are on Twitter. <laughs> I mean, it's horrible, y'all. It, it, it is really, really horrible, some of the stuff. There are some mean, mean pastors out there in the world today who have way too much time on their hands. They need to be tending to the flock. Uh, but they've got, they've got time on their hands. And so, someone had, 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 of course it was a woman who posted this, which sent this male Theo bro over the edge. Um, there's a theme here, by the way. And I have, I have an example of this, I just can't find it on my iPad right now. Um, oh, I wonder. Oh, there he is. Great, while you're looking for that. Yeah. From Ellen Minning. I saw a YouTube video overview of Ruth that posted that Ruth shows us how God can work and use people and their everyday experiences and hardships for renewal and remake. Indeed. So this, this, this woman had posted this simple thought, theology without love is dead. That's a paraphrase of the book of James. <laughs> But theology without love is dead. And this Theo bro, who just has a habit of attacking people on Twitter, I mean, it is horrible. His response to her is, first, love of God, which makes one loyal to his revelation, which necessarily makes one complementarian. Complementarianism being the belief that in male domination, right? Okay. <laughs> that God has created male and men and women for different roles in life. That's complementary. And so she's saying theology without love is dead, and he's demonstrating how theology without love <laughs> is dead. He is the epitome of it right here, right? And this is the problem we're facing in so much of Christianity. There's a strain of virulent Christianity right now that is so much focused on the law and rules and everyone ex finding the interpretation to be exactly like they see it and they're all white males every one of them yeah right <laughs> which is not an indictment on white males it's an indictment on those white males right they want to lord it over everyone and they miss the law of love and i tell you this example because i think this is exactly what we want to find out of the book of ruth First of all, it's a story about women who have a gospel message for us. But it's also a story about defying stereotypes and love overcoming law. That's what we want to find in the story. I hope that sets the stage for you. Next week, we'll actually get into the text of Ruth. <laughs> but I think the thing, the thing that blew my mind is it's really all about love <laughs> He's, well, he's the one who made the difference. He's the one who reached out. Nothing would have happened without Boaz, and he's the Jewish link. That's he's right. Ruth. Ruth is not Jewish. Right. And Boaz isn't. And everybody goes like Ruth is. Sure, she 
did it and she was a, a, available. Right. But he's the only one who initiated it without you. So uh, the, uh, Trisha's point is Boaz is key to the story. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about him. Uh, you know, the whole idea of a kinsman redeemer uh, out, out of Jewish tradition. Uh, and it's, it, it's, it, it, is a, it is a simple yet complicated story, right, um, that I hope we'll find a lot of uh, meaning in. <sighs> yeah, Henry? What? Where are you? What pages? Uh, I just uh, got us through chapter one today. <laughs> so for next week, read chapter two. Read through chapter two. Yeah. Right if you're following along the book, I did basically excerpts of chapter one today. And if you want to get the companion to this, uh, the, the poet's book is Sorry for Your Troubles. And the poems in it are stunning. Next week, I'll read you a few of them. Uh, I got I to gotta measure myself. Uh, on this, they're, and they're brief. If if you say, "Oh, I don't like poetry," these are brief poems. Like you could read them in thirty seconds. Haikus are preferable. <laughs> they're longer than a haiku, yes, uh, and not as much fun as a limerick. Why did, why did I guess there are two books in the Bible that are about women or that are named for women? Oh, Ruth and Esther. Ruth and Esther. Yeah. How did that in a very patriarchal society? You know, back yeah, then. how did they, how get, did in? they get in there? Yeah. Well, because it, it, it part is Trish said uh, the book of Ruth is really also about Boaz. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it also has historical importance. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, and then Esther, also a very misunderstood book. Maybe we need to do the study on that sometime. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we all have found those for such a time as this moments. And <laughs> what some people think is for such a time as this, I think is they've read the tea leaves wrong. But anyhow. It's to that's build me. buildings. <laughs> right. Raise money. All right, we need to stop. Yes. Oh, I was just going to say, when we were in Ireland, they showed us all these places and so forth. But if anybody wants to know more about the troubles, that video of, I think Netflix has it, Michael Collins. Michael goes Collins. through the whole revolution. And of course, it's a movie, but still it does show a lot. Right, yeah. It, yeah. It, there's a lot of resources out there on the, the, the Irish conflict. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's uh, from us, we might look at this and say, well, my God, how'd that go on so long? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah. they might look at us and say, how have your troubles gone on so long? It, it, yeah. Right? It's all perspective. <laughs> it's all perspective. Right, okay. Well, for those at home, let's uh, say a prayer, and then for those here, we'll hear our prayer requests. And uh, if you have any updates, please send them to Charlene. And um, excited to be on this new journey with you as well. Lord, uh, grant us grace now, and help us to hear your still small voice in the midst of the loudness all around us. Help us to be inspired by stories of courage. And in that spirit, we pray today, especially for the people of Ukraine, that you would grant them courage and strength, and that the right would indeed prevail, and that justice would be known. We pray for your spirit to be upon each one facing the battles of life today, that you would grant grace and peace and hope through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And...